forum um, and go over a few logistics for the webinar. The Western Governors Drought Forum is the chairman's initiative of Governor Brian Sandoval of Nevada. Uh, Governor Sandoval, as chairman of WGA this year, uh, asked WGA to create a framework for sharing best practices on drought management and response. In this workshop series, or it, it, through the Drought Forum, we've so far had a workshop series that, I didn't, that went through the impacts of drought in different economic sectors all across the Western states. Through that webinar, that workshop series, we identified some common themes that we've been diving into through these webinars. All of the webinars are publicly available and posted on the WGA website at westgov.org. So if you'd like to see anything that we've done in the past or look into future drought forum uh, webinars, um, we really urge you to do so. Um, today we are joined by uh, moderator Tony Willardson, the executive director of the Western States Water Council. Uh, Tony will deliver uh, his own introduction and give a, a couple of opening remarks in just a moment, but um, next I want to give you guys a, a little bit of an overview of the logistics for asking questions. Um, after the panelists give some brief opening remarks, Tony will uh, moderate a discussion between all of the panelists. Um, at that, um, any time in the presentations, you're welcome to ask questions. Please send those in by writing those chat box, those chat, uh, those questions through the chat box directly to me, Carly Brown, and I will send them along to Tony. Um, we will uh, record this webinar, and a recording will be available uh, by this Friday. You will uh, get a email notification whenever it's posted online. Again, for technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application, and for questions for the panelists or the moderator, please message me, Carly Brown. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to Tony Willardson with the Western States Water Council. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to tell you just a bit about the Western States Water Council, but first want to thank the Western Governors Association for hosting these webinars and forums and also recognize the leadership of Governor Sandoval of Nevada in addressing drought, which is obviously the last several years been uh, critical in many of our states. Uh, the council was created by the Western Governors in 1965 and represents 18 states. Its members are appointed by and advise the, advise the governors on water policy issues. Uh, Water-related data information is critical when it comes to planning for, assessing, and also managing drought and other water resources challenges. Uh, access to accurate and reliable data is fundamental to sound science and decision making. And while our knowledge and experience with water data gathering and analysis and dissemination of that data continues to expand, in many cases it's not sufficient to meet our needs. Uh, the Council, uh, with the WGA's support, has also initiated a water data exchange, which we call WADE, uh, to facilitate access to state information on water rights, uh, water supply, water use, and water planning. Uh, this data is gathered and developed by Western states and will be accessible through WADE. Uh, this will also use the cloud to help uh, uh, disseminate this information. St several states are well along. Uh, in this process and the deployment of our water data exchange and more information is available on our website, which is www.westernstateswater.org. Uh, also uh, today we'll talk a bit about uh, a number of different observation systems uh, and also the importance of integrating those on the ground or on the water systems. Uh, with uh, remote sensing measurements from satellites, which are of growing importance. And we're going to hear from a number of experts in various fields, and I'll give you just some brief introductions, and we'll go from there. Uh, first, we'll hear from Mike Strobel, who is the director of the National Water and Climate Center and the Natural Resources Conservation Service within USDA. Uh, our second panelist will be uh, Deke Arndt, who is the Chief of the Climate Monitoring Branch for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Climate Data Center. A third will be Terry Fulp, who is the Lower Colorado Regional Director for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation within the Department of Interior. And then finally, we will hear from Rebecca Moore, uh, Engineering Manager of Google Earth Observation. Google Earth Outreach and also uh, the Earth Engine at Google. So with that, uh, we will go to the presentation from Mike. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, can you hear me okay then? Okay. Yes, Let's we can ahead. hear you. Okay, good. Uh, let's go ahead and just, we'll go through the slides here. I'm going to talk about some programs that we operate through the NRCS. And the main one, of course, is the Snow Survey and Water Supply Forecasting Program here in the western U.S. We also have the Soil Climate Analysis or SCAN Network. And then the last thing I'll mention um, is, as, as my final slide is to talk real briefly about a, an initiative that we're working on now, which is a National Soil Moisture Network. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the distribution of our monitoring networks, the light colored, the green ones uh, on this map are the manual snow courses, and we have those throughout the western U.S. in the high altitude um, areas, as well as up into Canada and Alaska. The blue ones on this map are the snow tell, which are our automated sites, and the red ones are the soil moisture sites, the scan sites that are nationwide, not only in the western U.S., but throughout the U.S. Next slide, please. The manual snow course measurements actually is an effort that began over 100 years ago, and this is a cooperative snow survey program, so we work closely with many other agencies to cooperatively collect the data at the beginning of each month through the winter, so starting in January through June, to collect um, snow depth and snow water equivalent measurements at over 1,100 sites uh, in the U.S., Canada, and up into Alaska. And these are sites that we physically have to go to and with snow tubes make manual measurements at these sites. And many of these, periods, many of these sites have periods of records decades long, so they're very valuable records. Next slide, please. The other network that we have with the snow monitoring is the Snowtel network, which began in the late 70s. And this is an automated system that throughout the 13 western states, and we include South Dakota and the Black Hills as part of this, we have 885 sites that collect information in near real time. So we transmit the information hourly. And not only do we collect information on snow depth and snow water equivalent, but we collect many other parameters, and I'll talk about that in a second. The value of these is, is twofold. One is that we get so much more information on a wide variety of, of parameters, not just on the snow depth itself and the snow water equivalent. And we transmit this information many times. So for one measurement at a snow course, we actually get, in, in this case, about 720 measurements or uh, uh, transmitted information hourly um, at the same site. So it's very valuable in that way. Another critical part of this network is that it's automated so that we're not sending uh, personnel up into very hazardous conditions, high altitude, snow-packed areas in the winter months. We go out and do summer maintenance at these sites. So valuable in that way for safety factors. Next slide, please. The sites consist of um, a number of sensors. We look, you can see the, the, the snow pillow on the ground, which will measure then the, the the weight of the snow, and we have a depth measurement above that. So with those two measurements, we can calculate out uh, how much water content is within the snow itself. But we also measure other parameters such as air temperature, wind, speed and direction, solar radiation, relative humidity, a number of these factors which really help with understanding what's happening at each of these sites from a climatic perspective. One of the things we also have at these sites at about half of our snow tell sites is soil moisture and soil temperature. So we put those in at, at, at about roughly half our sites. We're expanding that part of the network to um, increase that data collection because what happens in the soil is very relevant to what's going to be the fate of the snow melt uh, come the springtime. Next slide, please. We have very many products that we put out here at the National Water and Climate Center, and here's just some examples of some of the products of um, graphic distribution of snowpack showing you at March 1st, so at the beginning of each month, where we're at with the snowpack. We do this uh, both with point maps and with basin maps, uh, basin fill maps, to give you a good idea of where we are based on percent of normal, based on a 30-year period. And then we also come up with our forecast for spring and summer uh, stream flow based, and we improve this as we go through the year, but we do this at the first of each month, and so we give an idea also uh, through many of our different tools of what our forecast will be for um, the water supply for the upcoming summer. Next slide, please. The other network is the Soil Climate Analysis Network, and this is the SCAN network that has 221 sites across the U.S. where we're doing soil climate uh, analysis. 
Uh, this is critical for drought monitoring. We look at conditions in the soils and provide this information for folks that are looking at not just for local agriculture, but for large spatial areas for looking at, at drought conditions, at soil conditions, and climatic conditions. Next slide, please. And the last thing I'll mention is the National Soil Moisture Network. This is something that we're working on now. It's a collaboration of many federal, state, and university groups. What we're doing is looking at taking in situ measurements, remote sensing, um, such as the SMAP satellite that recently was launched, and models, and coming up with a single product that can be used for um, assessing drought conditions within the U.S. and soil moisture conditions. And with that, I'll finish up. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Deke, do you like to go ahead next? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Deke Arndt. I'm the chief of the climate monitoring branch at um, what is quickly becoming the National Center for Environmental Information. We're in the middle of a, of a data center consolidation with our sister organizations in oceanic data and geophysical data. So I will probably refer to us as NCDC, but our, technically we are now one of the national centers uh, for environmental and information. I run the monitoring, climate monitoring branch here. Um, we do a few things. Uh, we basically uh, do the play-by-play -play of the climate system. We monitor what's going on with the climate around the U.S. and around the world, but probably more importantly for this conversation, uh, we contribute a few authors to the U.S. Drought Monitoring, uh, U.S. Drought Monitor, Drought monitor program, um, so basically the weekly assessments of drought that are shared responsibility among several federal and state agencies. We contribute a few authors. We also host uh, drought.gov, which is the web home of uh, the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDAS, which shares a long uh, history of partnership and work with the WGA and many partners um, out in the West. So uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So the U.S. Drought Portal, again, um, most germane to, to this conversation, it is the web presence of NIDIS, uh, drought.gov uh, is um, where to find it. It is a, uh, NIDIS itself is a multi-agency program. It's shared among uh, a handful, many agencies, including three that are on the, uh, on the call today. It's, it's operationally led by NOAA, but it's owned by many agencies. Uh, the program office is is housed in Boulder, Colorado, um, and then drought.gov itself and the services related to drought.gov sit here in the monitoring branch in, uh, in Asheville. Um, the uh, NCDC, the National Climate Data Center, we also do uh, climate monitoring of our own. We speak to issues of, of, of water and drought, and we work very closely with, uh, with the folks in drought.gov to, to ensure that we're keeping track of exactly uh, what's going on. So next slide, please. Um, just a quick overview of drought.gov. It is the U.S. Drought Portal. It is a indeed a portal. It is designed to be a gateway to um, information that is most relevant for the type of user that is coming in. One thing that NIDIS historically has done very well that I've always admired is they've really understood from day one that drought means different things to different people in different communities, even at different times of the year. So um, they have always been very respectful of the fact that um, drought may mean something very different for a reservoir operator in California as it does uh, to a corn grower in Iowa. They're, they have vastly different sensitivities to time scales and the type of precipitation and when precipitation occurs. So one of the things that drought.gov and, and NIDIS in general have done is they've worked to establish these regional uh, pilot programs to um, determine which data sets and data approaches and data even presentations are most valuable for a number of different regions around the world as they continue to kind of build this intelligence. And what they find is um, exactly what the drought community um, has, has come to know over the 20 years that I've been involved in drought is that drought does mean very different things to different people and require different data approaches. And so um, if you were to go to drought.gov, um, NIDIS in general uh, and drought.gov in particular has historically been designed for uh, people who are heavily involved in managing um, and very sensitive to drought. It has recently um, come to uh, take on a little bit more of a general public and informational approach, but the basic structure of drought.gov is designed to deliver information for people that are used to coming to drought.gov. 
Um, and uh, so if you were to go there, you could go to some of these regional pilots and see what uh, folks in your part of the country, how they have chosen to construct the data that they use to work with each other on managing water and drought. Um, or you could, there's a handful of kind of uh, do-it-yourself, what's drought like in my backyard kind of informational tools as, as, as well. Uh, next slide. And this is my last slide. Um, in general, climate monitoring and, uh, and the types of data that we use both in the climate monitoring and that they use in drought.gov, um, we try to, again, respect um, not just that diff drought means different people to different, uh, in different times of year in different ways, but that we're also, one thing working with drought over time that becomes very apparent, and I think this will play out in many discussions, is we are a nation of states, especially when it comes to drought. So the way that we manage water, the way that we codify and make into law our management policies um, are very much, and we, we look like a nation of states in the agreements and the management and the professional and, and legal relationships between people who manage water um, have been built up over a long time. And so the, uh, the uh, Approaches and the data sets that we use have also been built up over a long time. So uh, I'll get more into these, I think, probably in the discussions, but it's an important thing to remember that the, uh, the way that we not just understand scientifically about drought, but the things that we do as practicing professionals um, in managing drought have developed over a, a long time, and that will be part of uh, those histories, the histories of the scientific development and the management development um, will be part of that, that shaft. <laughs> We're talking about the tip of the spear today, um, but there is a, a historical shaft uh, behind that spear with a great deal of knowledge. And while new data opportunities um, really are exciting, um, the way that they are integrated with existing practices and data is going to be really important in how we improve our drought management as we go forward. And I believe that's my last slide. Thanks, Deke. Terry, you're up next. Okay, thanks, Tony. Again, I'm Terry Falk. I'm the Regional Director of the Lower Colorado Region of the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, before I get started, let me introduce uh, two of my staff. I have two folks with me, Angela Adams and Shauna Tiggy. And I understand we might go a little past the top of the hour. If so, unfortunately, I will have to leave, but my staff is very involved here and they'll be able to stay on in case the discussion does continue. What I wanted to do quickly was to give you an overview of who we are, what we do, and then focus on our use of data and technology uh, in accomplishing uh, that mission. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a picture of the Colorado River Basin. Many of you are familiar with it, I'm sure. There is a geopolitical line drawn in the middle of that diagram that separates the upper basin from the lower basin. That was done in a 1922 compact. Uh, amongst the seven basin states. Um, it's of interest to us because we're sitting in the lower basin. Our headquarters are at Boulder City, Nevada, the home of Hoover Dam, and we manage that lower basin uh, diagram, as you see there, that uh, area from essentially Lake Mead down to Mexico. At basin as a whole, uh, we are over allocated uh, based on what we've seen uh, over this last hundred years of of inflows. However, we're not yet overused, primarily because the upper basin states have not uh, fully de developed their entitlements, and I think uh, we all are concerned over the future as uh, development does continue basin-wide. There are many operational challenges, but I want to make sure and point out one unique part of our system. We can store four times, roughly four times, the annual average inflow into the system. It's a unique, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a new reservoir <laughs> system in that sense, in that we can buffer ourselves against drought because of that large amount of storage. Next slide, please. This just focused on that lower basin piece again, uh, essentially the last nearly 700 miles of the Colorado River, which we're, um, my office uh, has the responsibility to operate and maintain. Um, we, the Secretary of the Interior is essentially the water master on this part of the Colorado River main stem. And what we mean by that, uh, all users have a contract to take water. Uh, uh, we account for all water use that's uh, used in that. And we also, of course, schedule and deliver uh, 
uh, all the water to those turnouts for our uh, customers to take. We also, de so we delivered about 7.5 million acre feet of water to those three lower division states, as we call them, Arizona, Nevada, and California, plus another 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico. Data is extremely important to us to do that. Uh, we have um, a large investment in a data network as well as in uh, other technology that um, I'll show you in just a minute. Before I leave the slide, I do want to point out um, we are, if we look at the last 15 years of inflows into the system, this is the lowest 15-year period we've seen in our 100-plus years of record keeping. If we look at 1,200 years of tree ring reconstructions, it's certainly one of the worst 15-year periods that we've seen in 1,200 years. And probably the, the piece that's really of concern for the future is that the climate models look, uh, the look from climate models says that this drought we see today might be uh, in the 20 to 25th percentile of the worst periods we might see in the future. So. Lots of work going on basin-wide in terms of promoting conservation and other activities um, to stretch these water supplies as uh, far as they can go. Currently our system, again, uh, a system that can store about 60 million acre feet of water is about half full, 49% full. That's about where it's been, quite frankly, on the, over the last 10 years uh, during this drought. We were very fortunate when we entered the drought that we had the reservoirs almost completely full. That's, of course, no, never guaranteed in these long, pro prolonged droughts. Um, this year uh, looks to be another below average year. Our current snowpack is 87% of average, and our inflow forecast is about 79% of, of average. Next slide, please. Well, um, before I get into uh, how we actually use data, I do want to tell one quick personal story. When I came to work for the Bureau of Reclamation some 25 or so years ago, our database was essentially paper and notebooks and a few what we called Fortran trans flat files, if you all remember the old uh, days of Fortran programming. Um, we set out on this path of a data-centered decision support system, and um, that's exactly where we are today and how we utilize it. I will just touch on a few of these pieces, but the center here is a relational database, and from that database, um, our information is served. Next slide, please. If I look at the real-time data and collection uh, of storage, we have a very uh, large data collection network down here with the USGS as well as some of our own gauges. Uh, more than 100 gauges operate and maintained by our two agencies over our area here in the lower basin. Uh, about a quarter of those report on a 15-minute interval. Um, others uh, uh, report on um, at least daily. They assist us in tracking water flow as well as all the diversions that folks are taking off the river and the return flows, which are extremely useful in, in meeting downstream deliveries. The next slide, please. So when we look at water use projections based on all that real-time network, uh, this is just a quick view that we put up each day and we are able to track approximately 98% on a daily basis of all the water deliveries of that 9 million acre feet of water to the lower basin states in Mexico. It is a, a well-used website by all of our water purveyors. They track this daily to make sure that they stay within their entitlement, which is an annual entitlement. Next slide, please. So we also do long, midterm, and short-term projections, both for operational and planning purposes. Just a slide to show you some of that. This is all, again, uh, we pull the historical data from the database, do the projections, and put those projections back to the database, obviously in a very separate uh, place in the database, but then that allows us to serve it out to our customers in a very uh, efficient manner. And one last uh, click, please, I believe. Yes, and I want to just quickly talk about how we disseminate that information and knowledge. It is through the website. Um, this is an area that, 
that uh, we have continued to work on over time. Once we got everything in place, this is an area we continue to want to expand. Certainly all of our customers are very f uh, familiar with what products we put on our website and help us design new ones. But more recently, we've been actively involved in the open water data activities um, it, within the Department of Interior. The President's executive order uh, called for the federal government to make open and machine readable, as it was called, the new uh, default state for government information. We're doing a pilot down here to further um, ex improve our visualization and improve the ability of others to use our data. And um, I believe that's all. Tony, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, I am at least am old enough to remember Fortran and running punch cards through the mainframe at two in the morning. Good. <laughs> we we've come a long way from that, and that's a good segue uh, to Rebecca's presentation to tell us about what uh, some of the things that Google's doing. Rebecca. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, hope you all can hear me. Uh, it's been great to hear the previous panelists. Um, as you can tell, with respect to drought, there is mature science, there are extensive databases that have been developed, there are sophisticated decision support tools, um, and, you know, at Google, we're kind of the new kids on the block coming into this field, um, but uh, Tony invited us because, as he mentioned at the beginning, there are still some gaps um, with respect to access to data, freshness of the data, um, and there's still opportunities to make improvements in uh, those tools. So I'm going to speak, um, you know, change course a little bit here and speak about a new technology platform that we've developed over the last few years called Google Earth Engine, which is for global scale environmental monitoring. The first applications were in forestry, but there are some very promising applications now with respect to water resources and, and drought monitoring that I'll, I'll share a little bit with you about. Um, next. N next. Next slide, please. One second. So, um, Tony and, and the organizers asked me to uh, tell a little bit of the origin story of, of, of Google Earth Engine. Um, here we go. Um, Google Earth Engine was born basically in um, in 2008 in the Brazilian Amazon. Let's see, can we go into presentation mode here? Uh, or back, back please. Looks like the animations aren't working. Uh, but the, uh, we were approached by scientists in the, in the Amazon because uh, they were seeing deforestation at the rate of uh, more than a million acres a year. And that deforestation could be observed from satellite imagery from space. Uh, however, um, uh, and they had the science to do the analysis and virtually detect deforestation uh, from that data coming in every day. But the problem was it was terabytes or even petabytes of remote sensing data. And when they tried to run that deforestation analysis on a single computer, it would take weeks. And so they approached us to see if Google, because we had Google Earth and Google Maps, could we build something new? Um, Earth and Maps, Google Earth and Google Maps are, are not quite appropriate for this problem because all they allow, they allow you to look at satellite data or do navigation, they don't allow you to do science or to detect change or to map trends on the changing surface of the planet. Um, so it's, it seems like a Google scale problem uh, to try to address this type of environmental monitoring. Next. And there's a tremendous amount of publicly available satellite data. Uh, these are just the NASA satellites currently in orbit. Um, this, it's a treasure trove of information about, you know, land, water, atmosphere, ocean. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one, uh, one excellent example that's very relevant for drought monitoring um, and evapotranspiration is the Landsat satellite. I think many of you are probably familiar with it. It's the longest continuously operating Earth-observing mission. It's been going for more than 40 years. 
It collects not just pretty pictures of the Earth, but multispectral data that includes infrared and thermal bands. Um, it covers the, the whole world every 16 days, and it's now collected millions and millions of images, um, and it's a, it's a fantastic resource. Um, next slide, please. However, this is where it, it resides. The data from the Landsat satellites and many other satellites tend to come off the satellite and go onto tapes in a vault in government archives. So the data is quite secure, which is excellent, but it's not that accessible uh, for doing analysis, particularly if you're trying to do timely global analysis. Next slide, please. So that was our, our starting point to uh, liberate, if you will, uh, some of these massive big data, Earth observation data sets that are really critical for uh, doing global Earth monitoring and bring them online into uh, Google data centers. Next, please. and uh, into the platform that we call Earth Engine. We call it Earth Engine because it's an analytical engine for the planet, and the goal is to derive information from raster and vector data at scale. Next slide, please. Let's see if this uh, WebEx is going to show this video. Perhaps not. Um, this is a time-lapse animation, um, if it were coming over, over WebEx, of, uh, of Las Vegas. Uh, with this video, you would see Las Vegas growing while Lake Mead shrinks. Um, next. This um, time-lapse animation that we built of the whole planet, it's, it's available at earthengine.google.org slash time-lapse. Um, we've got the entire Earth at 30 meter resolution for almost 30 years. Uh, and you can go anywhere and see planetary change, um, such as uh, ice caps receding, glaciers receding, uh, urban development, and, uh, and, and uh, water uh, bodies changing. The thing that was key about it, it was uh, 2,000 or 2 million Landsat scenes were required to be analyzed, almost a petabyte of data. It required 2 million hours of computation uh, but because we ran that over 66,000 computers in parallel, we had the result in a day and a half, whereas it would otherwise have taken almost 300 years. Next slide, please. Um, so we, I said we built the platform for science uh, fundamentally, and our first major scientific result was with uh, Professor Matt Hansen at University of Maryland to create the first detailed maps of global forest cover and change from 2000 to 2012, which was published in Science Magazine uh, in, in 2013. Next, please. And what I wanted to tell you this, the story about the forestry case, because we think it's very relevant for, for water. Um, our goal is to turbocharge the best science and help drive it into operational use on uh, near real-time data um, and make that information accessible to, to everyone, who, to all the decision makers who need access to it. And so, uh, as an example here, um, within just a couple of weeks of that global forest cover map and data set being ready, um, a new application called Global Forest Watch was launched, which is powered by Earth Engine, and it is doing near real-time updating of the state of the world's forests. Next, please. So now let's segue to water. If the first couple of years of Earth Engine were really focused on forestry, I think 2015 and, and forward is, is we're very focused on water resources, drought, flooding, uh, and so on. Uh, so I'd like to just mention uh, a couple of examples of applications that are being built with uh, science partners at University of Idaho, University of Nebraska, and Desert Research Institute. This is Rick Allen, Aisha Killick, and Justin Huntington. Um, next, please. So this is a, a slide contributed by Rick Allen. Um, and we're looking at um, evapotranspiration reference fraction 
for the Palo Verde Irrigation District that was computed using Google Earth Engine. Um, they have uh, moved the metric algorithm, which I think some of you may be familiar with, onto Earth Engine in order to accelerate its um, the, uh, the frequency with which the results can be produced, the taking it to global scale, and making it freely available. The challenge with this data today is there's an asymmetry in who has access to this information from metric. You need to be somewhat of an expert to work with it. And so the idea is to make this kind of information about evapotranspiration, water consumption by crops, much more accessible. Next, please. Um, again, we're not getting the animation, but uh, what you were seeing here is two slides. Uh, in the background is the evapotranspiration uh, algorithm, EE flux, running inside Google Earth Engine. And this overlay is an example of the use of this data by um, Gallo Winery to uh, monitor crop water use. Next, please. The last example I wanted to mention is from Justin Huntington's group. And this is, again, uh, the, the goal is to make information about drought and climate much more accessible. Next, please. So they're building an application, and this should be ready uh, later this year, called CLIME, C-L-I-M-E. You come into a very simple web interface. Next slide, please. And you can choose from a variety of uh, indices and data sets uh, and derived data sets that are produced on the fly um, in Earth Engine based upon fresh uh, data. Next slide, please. Uh, so, for example, if you want to run any of these, up comes a, a calendar with the data that is available. Next slide, please. And in this case, it's uh, producing the, the Palmer Drought Severity Index uh, for the U.S. Again, um, it's, it's not that this type of index hasn't been available before. But our goal with these science partners is to turbocharge their work to essentially, um, they shouldn't have to worry about the infrastructure of managing the data coming in every day, um, having access to thousands of computers to do really quick analysis, and turning that around into a very accessible web-hosted application. We're trying to solve some of those infrastructure challenges to, um, to really transform access to this kind of data. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. It's amazing to see uh, what Google can do with the information. Uh, we're going to have a discussion among the panelists now, uh, and we have extended the length of the webinar for an additional half hour. Uh, but if there are, is anyone on the line who uh, has any burning questions who can't stay with us um, past the top of the hour, or particularly for Terry, since uh, Terry's may have to sign off uh, then, uh, please send those to Carly and we'll see if we can get to them. Uh, one question uh, that I'd like to pose, uh, Rebecca, for you and for the other panelists, is this information now is freely accessible. Uh, there's no charge. Uh, what's the impact of that policy, which is currently a federal policy, uh, to your programs? Uh, just to clarify the question, do you mean uh, that the Landsat data is free, or, or do you mean that we have committed to providing these derived information products for free? Well, ac actually, that the data is free. Oh, it's, it's, it's um, incredibly, uh, it's critical that the government has made that data free. Um, we did a calculation of what it would have cost to produce that Matt Hansen uh, global forest cover um, map and data set in the days when Landsat cost $600 a scene, and it would have been $30 million worth of data, which uh, no one could afford. So the fact that this data is free, I think, has um, really spurred innovation, and it's made it possible, frankly, for Google Earth Engine really even to exist and to be able to host all those petabytes of data for the benefit of uh, the global community. Well, thanks, Rebecca. 
Uh, Deke, uh, for you and then uh, the other panelists, uh, what gaps do you see that still exist in data collection uh, to make products such as the uh, drought monitor more robust and useful? Hi, right, thank you. Um, so uh, what gaps exist? I think <clears throat> if you ask any scientist or any water manager, um, we would all say, yeah, we want <clears throat> data up to the minute and we want it at the highest resolution possible. We want it to stretch back as far into history as possible and we want it to be as accurate as possible. And that's kind of the holy grail of, of what a data set or a data product based on a data set would offer. Um, with the remote sensing technology, you know, the uh, radar and satellite information, we have really increased our ability to get higher resolution uh, information. Um, the one thing that, that I guess the, the gap that, that would exist is how do we attach relatively recent remote sensing and satellite observing technology, which has developed anywhere over the last five to 35 years or so, to the deeper record, um, which is uh, 130, 135 years long, and is the data upon which our scientific understanding and many of our management practices are built on. I think that's a real, um, a real challenge and opportunity. Everybody is working on how do we splice um, this really rich historical traditional data, um, like the snow course data that Dr. Strobel uh, talked about, with um, satellite imagery that provides maybe more frequent or higher resolution information about snow, but really lacks kind of the ground truthing accuracy. Um, in the, in, at NCDC here, we have a, a program called the uh, Climate Data Records Program that's trying to do exactly that. How do we stitch um, remotely sensed data onto the longer term record and even remotely sensed data from the different satellites that have provided it over time um, together? Um, we won't solve that by ourselves. I think it's a, a big challenge uh, to benefit the most from the uh, rich resolution available through remotely sensed data, but also account for some of the discontinuities and some of the disconnect between the era in which that satellite data existed and uh, our deeper understanding. I I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, you don't talk about drought in Oklahoma in unless you understand what happened in the 1930s and in the 1950s. And many folks in America and around the world understand that their management practices were really informed by situations that happened two, three uh, generations ago. So I think that's a, a really neat opportunity. It will generate a lot of research, uh, public, private, academic sectors, and I think it's, a, it's a, a nice opportunity for us to get a lot smarter in how we deal with drought. Okay, thanks, Deke. Uh, you know, some of the technology is even putting sensors on cell phones. Uh, is crowdsourcing going to be a viable option uh, now or in the future to supplement some of the lack of our data uh, in situ measurements on the ground? Is that for me, Tony? Uh, for you or anyone who wants to take it, yes. I will say that the, coming from a data center uh, kind of point of view, um, the entry of old data. You know, uh, Rebecca used the term liberated, and we use that term a lot when we talk about um, not just reams of, of satellite data on tape, but uh, reams of handwritten data on paper. And crowdsourcing has actually been a solution proposed and, and executed by several groups around the world to help get um, handwritten data off of ship logs and old weather reports um, and get them into uh, digital archives where smart, innovative people can do a lot more about it. So uh, I won't go as far as the observing networks, but I know just from a liberating data standpoint, it's a really valuable approach. Thanks. Uh, Mike, a question for you. How is soil moisture monitoring important in understanding drought severity and its potential impacts? Uh, that, that, that's a good question, Tony. I think that the, 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 the things that the monitoring provide to us, and we're looking at as, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have in situ, we have, as Deke mentioned, with the remote sensing and radar, as well as the modeling itself, we have different levels and different approaches to looking at soil moisture and relating this then to drought conditions. What this provides to us, I think, by having this integration of, of various 
methods of measuring soil moisture is it gives us a better understanding of the spatial variability uh, in the soil moisture. And I mean that in, in a way of looking at it across the country or across the region, but also with the in situ measurements, we are looking at not just what's happening at the surface, but we have sensors at, at, at depth. Um, so we're not looking only at the surface, but we're also looking into the root zone, into areas that certainly impact vegetation, agriculture, hydrology, and other aspects. And for example, the scan network, we have sensors that, using the English measurements, at 2, 4, 8, 20, and 40 inches in depth. So this gives us not just what's happening on the surface, but really a, a, a three-dimensional look at what's happening with soil moisture. And this is really critical for you know, applying this information and looking at, at drought conditions because it's not just what's happening at the surface. And it's not just what's happening in, in one small area or one region where we have observations, but really bringing these, these kind of sources of information together. The, the, the one area that I think that we um, are lacking in when it comes to soil moisture, especially with the in situ measurements, is really having a period of record to compare it to. And we, we, we make measurements of, of soil moisture, but to look at it and how you would compare that to what's normal, what's, what's average at that site for a period of record like we have with the snow courses and with other weather and, and climate data sources is having a 30-year period that we can compare it to. And we haven't got there yet on, on most of our sites. And so that's an area that we're, we need to see improvement on if we're going to truly understand what's happening with drought conditions. Hey, thanks. Uh, Rebecca, one of the themes of the drought forums that uh, WGA has sponsored has been that the fact that there is an abundance of good data already being collected. It's just difficult to access. And you've talked a little bit about what Google is doing. Can you talk about expanding your efforts and uh, possibly including hydrologic data as well as satellite imagery and what that might take? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we did start uh, more with the satellite imagery and the, the data sets that were required for forest monitoring, but now we are bringing in a number of NOAA data sets, weather data sets, and some hydrology-related data sets, such as uh, watershed boundaries, flow accumulation layers. Um, we have partners that are working on analyzing flood risk. Obviously, uh, we spoke about the work Rick Allen's group is doing with um, evapotranspiration, um, and so, and even actually quantifying river migration. So, um, we do see uh, water monitoring management drought forecasting as a critical um, area for us. And as scientists who are using the platform come to us with requests for data sets that we should be hosting, we actually, uh, we crowdsource that from the scientists. They sort of vote on what we should be making sure to ingest in Earth Engine. And we are seeing a lot of interest in hydrology data sets, so we are prioritizing those. Okay, thank you. And Terry, a, a couple of questions for you. First, you mentioned the Open Water Data Initiative and sharing reclamation uh, data with the public and users as a decisions in looking at drought conditions. How has this been done before and, and why is this happening now? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, well, as I alluded to just quickly in the uh, uh, front end of my overview, we serve a lot of data out on our website, but it's not really of a very interactive nature, number one. And it also is a little bit about, uh, if I could use this term, a little inside baseball type of stuff in, in that it's really directed more for our customers, our direct users of water uh, who understand all the subtleties of and complexities. And I think part of what we're trying to do with the open data initiative is to um, make it much more clear and easy for folks to not just access but understand so that um, other people outside um, our direct customers would uh, be able to benefit from uh, accessing that data um, and maybe doing you know their own uh, analysis of it of course. Um, why now? I think it's just in a couple things. One is certainly we have this initiative uh, from the president that um, uh, is uh, absolutely uh, the right thing that we should be doing as public servants. 
I think number two, though, um, it's sort of the natural evolution. You got to first get out of flat files. You got to first get the data accessible, and and then from that you can start to really understand uh, how people might want to use it in order to to make it more accessible and in the right formats. And, and Terry, you're you're a reservoir operator. Uh, what are the tools that you really use, uh, and and how are they relevant in making on the ground decisions? Okay. Well, thanks again. Tony, for moving that question up, maybe in the order. Um, again, I apologize, I might have to drop off, but will again say that my staff is here and can um, help you in lots of ways, hopefully. With regard to that, I think Deke made a great comment earlier on, I believe it was Deke, that you know, the meaning of drought and the impact of drought is very dependent upon who you are and where you are. And in our example down here, when we're managing this lower basin system, uh, we're at the bottom of the system, and we have this benefit of this large amount of storage. And so something, for instance, like the drought monitor, although very interesting to us and something we do look at, we don't really utilize that in our decision-making because, again, the water supply is to us is mostly what we have in storage. Just as a quick uh, um, fact here that might help folks, over 90% of the water in this basin is generated in the, that above that upper basin uh, line that, that we showed. Uh, that line that separated the two basins, less than 10% comes from our base, uh, lower basin down here. So we're very dependent on reservoir storage. And so with that uh, backdrop, uh, though, I also want to say that, that we real-time data collection, as I mentioned, is really crucial to our management down here. And what are we measuring? Stream flows, we're measuring diversions, we're measuring return flows. Return flows are a big part of most western water systems um, to, to, um, to help meet uh, users downstream. Uh, all that's within a, pri a very detailed priority system, of course. Um, as I also mentioned, um, it, um, you know, having that real-time data is important, but also having a a long time of, of consistent data recording is also important. I think Mike mentioned that early in his his point. Things like soil moisture uh, to are also very valuable in terms uh, for forecasters who are doing the inflow forecast that we all use um, on the Colorado River system. And so knowing current uh, soil moisture helps get better projections of what we might get in runoff when we see a snowpack. Uh, all that um, is predicated on having long records, and I can't overemphasize the importance of continuing um, all of our funding in order to make sure our data uh, is continually collected in a consistent manner at the right spatial and time, temporal time scale uh, scales. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Uh, uh, Deke, with regards to the drought monitor, uh, it is a collaborative federal effort uh, and is being used by a number of people. Can you talk a little bit more about the usefulness of the drought monitor? Uh, yes, you bet. So the drought monitor arose um, as a result of the drought community's conversations with actual with with, with um, people that are sensitive to drought around the country, and um, a lot of professionals like Terry. They have their specific set of tools. They know what they need to go to. Um, you know, the, he is uh, oversees a specific role in water management. Uh, the drought monitor wasn't necessarily designed um, to um, to grow that, although, like you said, he may use it as a reference. But what it arose was a, a single kind of one-shot assessment for the big picture of the drought situation around uh, the United States, and it's kind of um, uh, sensitive to two very generic kind of timescales of drought. One would be short term, which is drought that develops over weeks to months, um, which tends to be agriculture, wildfire management, those are the communities, uh, horticulture. Those tend to be really sensitive to drought on the short term timescale. You know, as soil moisture depletes, uh, things get bad in those areas. Uh, long term would be more groundwater um, to you know, some types of reservoir management. Um, you know, things about the you know, water supply you start getting into uh, when you're talking about, and water quality, when you're talking about long-term 
drought. So uh, what it is is a weekly assessment um, of uh, a number of different uh, data sets, what, what they call drought indicators, um, that have been tuned to uh, some of them to be a little more sensitive and blended to be a little more sensitive on the short term, some to be blended on the long term. And uh, every week there is an actual person responsible kind of as the editor in chief of the final assessment uh, of the drought monitor. The important and great and innovative thing, and I've always really respected and admired the drought community for this, is it is collaboratively built both in the long term and even each week. So there are hundreds of local experts around the country who will provide advice and insight on conditions that aren't necessarily able to be measured by the tools that we have now. And these are municipal water supplies, water quality issues, you know, things that you just readily can't push a button and understand what's going on. And so every week's map has a single author that kind of signs it and takes accountability for it. But we are putting those together um, with a great deal of insight from the states and, uh, and the communities out there and the federal agencies that have to manage resources as well, especially in the West. Uh, thanks, Dick. One, one more question, uh, if Terry's still on the line, but for all of you, is, is you talk about this interagency collaboration. That's perhaps been unprecedented with this current drought, uh, particularly in California, but elsewhere. What do you see as the future for this kind of interagency collaboration? Tony, this is Terry. I'll start that one off. Thank you again for um, uh, cherry picking the questions a little bit here based on my schedule. I do appreciate it. You know, I think the, the bottom line is this, is that certainly on the Colorado River, I can say that collaboration has been the foundation of every major policy decision we've made over the last 15 or so years. These are really complex issues and problems we're dealing with. Um, drought um, is the headliner of those, so to speak, um, and they really only get solved through that collaborative approach, in my opinion. Uh, what we really all are striving for, I believe, is to avoid court litigation and finally court decisions that may, in fact, not be the best decision because of all those complexities. Much better decisions are made by the folks who are really affected and, uh, and, and know what's going on. For us here in the lower uh, basin, um, I think we will absolutely continue that and even throughout the upper basin as well. The Colorado River, this is how it works. I can't speak much for Northern California, but I did want to say one quick thing. My counterpart, Dave Murillo, who's the regional director of what's called our Mid-Pacific region, I really feel for him. He doesn't have the benefit of this large storage capacity we have. Um, he's got another really bad year, but I, I know him well, and I know um, he will absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, continue the highest level of collaboration possible to get through this uh, really another dismal hydrologic year. So let me stop there with one last statement, and I think that old adage that from crisis comes opportunity. Uh, really works, and uh, certainly um, in most of our basins in the West, that's um, we're always looking for those collaborative uh, solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we will begin to take a few questions uh, from the participants. And, and Mike, a question for you related to the National Soil Moisture Network. How will scan the SCAN Soil Climate Analysis Network be integrated with that, and, and when will this be fully active and we'll start seeing some of the data? That's a good question. It's, 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 the SCAN is a, is a part of that. Now, if you look at it, as I mentioned in the presentation, and it was only one slide, there's three aspects of it. There's these in situ networks, there's the, the remote sensing, and then there's the modeling. And, and many of these areas have multiple sources of information as, for example, the in situ network, SCAN is one of those networks, but there's the CRN with the, with, that's part of, the, part of NOAA. There's many um, uh, other sources of, of, of networks that are more focused on, on, on state level um, monitoring for soil moisture. The, the difficulty here is that we have different sources of information, different, source, different types of sensors, different ways of collecting the data, different um, um, levels of spatial distribution of these, but 
we are working on that, and one part of it, uh, and this, I did this presentation recently at the Ag Forum back in Washington, D.C. just a couple of weeks ago. One part of this is to test this integration of these different networks out doing a pilot study. So we presently have begun, starting in January, a small pilot study that's going to be in the Texas, Oklahoma area in the Southern Plains, looking at using the information that I have outlined here and start to integrate this into a single product. So the timeline on that will be this will continue through um, through this year and we'll hopefully expand that into uh, a nationwide network here in future years. Hey, thank you. Uh, we want to thank uh, everyone who's joined and any of you who uh, need to log off, we understand uh, those who are available to stay for a few more questions, uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to continue. Uh, there's a question for the group and that's from a water management perspective, what key hydrologic data are we missing uh, to help us better manage our water supplies during a drought? Well, Tony, uh, this is Terry again. I'm still with you just for another minute or so. Um, I think we touched a little bit on soil moisture already, and uh, Mike's the expert there. We're going to let him chime in, but I think better handle on <clears throat> knowing antecedent water conditions, as we call it, so that we have a better uh, projection or forecast even of what's going to come off, particularly in these snow melt driven systems like ours is, uh, is one of those areas we need to um, focus on. Um, that, and I hate to be, sound like a broken record, but I would just reiterate that we, we can't drop the basic data stuff that we've been collecting for years, and that includes uh, water levels at reservoirs and rivers as well as temperature uh, and a lot of the other data that would go into those uh, evapotranspiration type things that Rebecca mentioned. Um, so all of this, to me, again, just says we've got to make sure that we continue what we have, figure out, as you're asking, what else we do need and fund it appropriately. Thanks, Terry. Uh, an observation from the Council, we've been very supportive of the Landsat work and the thermal infrared imagery and in measuring evapotranspiration uh, and use that in, in administration of water rights. Uh, but, Rebecca, a question for you. If, if Landsat were to stop operating uh, tomorrow, what impact would that have on your programs and, and would, would Google be in a position to replace a satellite, say? <laughs> um, well, you know, I think the good news is um, I'm on the Landsat advisory group and we just got some positive news a couple days ago that um, Landsat 9 has been approved and that there is um, a commitment now on the part of the U.S. government to instead of just doing one Landsat at a time, to actually have a program that goes out several decades uh, with plans for 9 and 10 and, and so on. So I, I think we can all breathe a little easier um, that the Landsat uh, mission is is getting better support. If it were to go away, I think it would be quite detrimental to a number of the the operational users of Earth Engine and the scientists and so on because it is it is such a, a uniquely valuable data set. And uh, no, Google has no no plans to to launch a comparable satellite. We we did acquire some of you may know. Um, a satellite uh, constellation company called Skybox, but it's quite different. Um, instead of being 30 meter with global coverage systematically every 16 days, it's one meter resolution, four bands of data, uh, and you, you task it. Um, and so it, it covers sort of different types of applications. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. That, that raises another question I'd like to ask for all of the panelists. The challenge of operating a program when you're funding, and particularly a pro federal appropriations, can be inconsistent. Uh, how does that affect your programs when you don't exactly know how much you're going to get or when there's a significant cut? Mike, maybe we can address that to you first. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, 
that that I don't think is unique to our agencies or to to any particular group. I mean, the fact is, is that we all try to have a, a longer term forecast for our planning purposes. And, you know, as part of our strat of our operations, we have a five year strategy um, planning document that we put together. And when you have fluctuating budgets, as has happened throughout the federal government, it's really difficult because you make investments that, especially when it comes to monitoring, in sites that, uh, based on you know a level of funding that you have at the present time, and as that fluctuates, and we've seen this over the recent years of of dollars going down and going up, it does make it very hard for us to to plan not only for um, the the infrastructure, but also for things such as personnel and um, making those kind of commitments is, uh, well, it, it adds a lot of uncertainty to it. So certainly I don't speak alone in my program in saying that um, uncertainty in, in, in budget estimates over the coming years um, adds to the difficulty in operating any program. And, and, and while we've got you, Mike, uh, the SNOW survey system operates basically in the 11 western states. Uh, but what's the importance of that to the nation? Well, you know, it's kind of a <laughs> that's kind of a tough question considering for a lot of the country right now, snow is kind of a bad word after this year. That's been more of a hindrance in the east than it has been an opportunity. I think it comes with education. I think that we need to make it clear that in the western U.S the high altitude snowpack really is our water supply where the majority of our spring and summer flows come from the snowpack. And so we need to get better information to the decision makers on the value and the necessity of accurate snow data and on all data in the western U.S. because we live in a very um, dry climate and a climate that water is very critical for, for all different aspects of what we do. We also need to better relate the utility of this information. Um, and it's not just water for the sake of water, but the fact is that hydroelectric power in the West, agriculture, water management of reservoir systems, recreation, aquatic habitat, hazards and risks from flooding, all these things are critical issues, in, and not just in the West, but throughout the country, but specifically in the West. And I think that we need to better inform folks that are decision makers of, of of the nature of this for us here in the western U.S. and that snow really is, snow and water supplies really are um, such a, a lifeline for everything that we do when it comes to economy and and agriculture and, and populations here in the western U.S. So it's just more of, I think, of, a, of an understanding and educational process that we need to all be vig vigilant on. Well, I guess we all know water runs downhill, and as uh, even though it's the western states, the Rocky Mountains have a big influence on flood control and navigation and flows uh, in the Missouri, obviously, and the Mississippi River system. Uh, another question along those lines uh, for all of the panelists, as uh, watersheds cross international borders, I'm wondering if you could comment on cross-border data sharing. Uh, this is... Uh... This is Deke, and I had uh, the opportunity to participate in a workshop um, that was uh, sponsored uh, through um, NOAA and, and some of our regional uh, climate activities as well uh, that did exactly that, examined uh, issues that are facing the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo uh, basin uh, in the uh, El Paso, New Mexico, the El Paso uh, area in particular, but along the Texas border and in the uh, streams and tributaries that feed the Rio Grande on both sides of the river. Um, and data sharing is uh, critical. There are uh, the, the meteorological departments of the different nations around the world do have kind of agreements in place uh, to share data, but um, not every nation is equipped to observe things exactly like we are, and that, that introduces some challenges. And, um, you know, what became really apparent in this exercise, again, with folks on both sides of the border, is, um, you know, kind of monitoring usage and, and really understanding um, how every water drop in that region uh, is used as water and water becomes more and more critical uh, through both population growth and uh, climate trends that we've seen there. Data sharing is going to be a key part 
of uh, getting the most out of the water uh, in the region down there. And when you mentioned the Rio Grande, I remember in the 90s participating in a discussion of drought. And one of the issues was that all the hydrologic maps ended at the U.S. side of the border. Uh, and it does make it challenging. There are cross-border uh, issues that we have to address holistically. Uh, the next question is for Rebecca. Uh, can you tell us uh, why you selected metric uh, as the primary evapotranspiration algorithm over other possible methods? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's probably helpful to clarify that um, Ultimately, we, we don't see ourselves choosing any one particular algorithm. Um, we feel like our, our role is to build, you know, not make people bet on one particular horse, but that we've built, we've built the best remote sensing analysis racetrack that has all the data coming in every day and access to fantastic computers so that different algorithms that each are attempting to do the same thing can actually be compared um, running on the same data with the same resources and, and pr be compared perhaps for the first time. And I think it's very instructive to see where algorithms agree and where they disagree. And this can be a way to advance science. We're seeing this happening now on the forestry side since that was an area that we started in first. Um, but, but to get back to, to, to metric, you know, when we move into a new application area, in this case, evapotranspiration, surface energy balance, um, it's, it can be a little bit uh, challenging at the beginning. We may not have the right data sets. Uh, we may not have all the right analytical functions. Um, so we look for sort of a, a leader in the field, right, who has, has a, a top algorithm but is also intrepid and willing to patiently work with us. Sometimes we have to issue Band-Aids, right, because they're really at the bleeding edge of Earth Engine. Um, so that we really get the platform in the state that it can handle those kinds of applications, in this case, surface energy balance. It's been great to work with, with Rick and Justin and, and Aisha because the metric is, is a very rigorous and well-respected algorithm. And, you know, we're looking forward to, to that really launching. And, uh, and actually, meanwhile, Justin is looking at um, another one called, I think it's called SEBOP. Uh, it's a different uh, surface energy balance algorithm. That may be the second one that comes. But we really welcome um, anyone in the scientific community who wants to, to try to move their algorithms onto our platform to give it a go. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, a question for all of the panelists. Uh, and Rebecca, you showed uh, some of the satellites that NASA uh, has up now, including the GRACE satellite measuring gravitational pull and groundwater mass. Uh, but satellite monitoring in the future, is it, is it just going to be remote sensing, or is there still going to be a role for on-the-ground data gathering and observations? Hey, this is, this is Deke. If I can jump in there, I think um, they, they need each other, uh, both types of observing platforms. Uh, need each other, uh, and it's not just for the sake of having more measurement. Um, they each have individual strengths. Um, again, it's kind of reflecting back on, on earlier, remote sensing does a fantastic job of providing a data point, kind of blanket coverage across a region. Um, so far, uh, getting exacting values uh, out of those without kind of direct calibration and validation exercises with on-the-ground measurement systems um, is, uh, just doesn't happen much. Um, we do need ground-based uh, measurement systems for two main reasons. One is to help get the most out of our remote sensing investments. And another, again, uh, to just beat, beat, <laughs> beat the dead horse, to connect these new and robust and broad remote sensing observations to what we have learned and known in the past, particularly in our management practices. Again, uh, being from Oklahoma, you don't talk about drought management, drought analysis, understanding of physical processes during extreme drought without looking into the 1930s and 1950s. Um, we need, we developed a lot of our drought decision-making capacities based on what we learned there. Connecting 
today's rich, robust, overwhelming volume of data with the um, with the historical relevance, uh, the ancestry of data that we have from the 20th century and even back into the 19th century is vital. Okay, thanks. Can I, uh, can, I, can I jump in on that as well? Please, please, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100% uh, was, that, was that Deke? 100% uh, that the two types of data are complementary and they're both necessary. I mean, it's called remote sensing for a reason, right? It's remote, it's indirect. Um, it has these great advantages of, of scale, but if you want um, a very precise direct measurement of some biophysical parameter, there's no substitute for the direct measurement. Let's take, for example, the snow tell, uh, snow measurements. So I think what we've tried to do with Earth Engine, although I focused today on the remote sensing, we also integrate the ground-based observation. People, a lot of scientists are going out literally with smartphones and doing uh, mobile data collection on the ground, and that data comes into the cloud and gets um, analyzed together with the remote sensing data. I, we talk about from the ground to the cloud. Both are necessary to have a complete picture. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, we'll wrap up here soon, but another question uh, for Mike, uh, and Deke, you might want to think about this too, but Mike, what is it that you need to make the uh, snow survey program more robust? And, and maybe another way of putting that, uh, using an arbitrary number, if, if, if you were appropriated another $2 million on top of your current budget, what would you do with that? Oh, well, certainly one of the things that does help with making any network more robust is having, as we mentioned earlier, the stable budgets, not having these fluctuations. So you can make long-term plans, which are, which are critical when you're developing any network uh, for observa ob observing Earth uh, features. Now, the other thing is having adequate personnel. Part of our program requires much labor, um, that being in summer maintenance, the installation of sites, the winter um, manual snow measurements. And so having adequate personnel is certainly part of that as well that makes um, for a very stable network. One of the difficulties there is that as many agencies are going through, I mean, we've had a, a large number of recent retirements and there's a lag time on trying to replace these positions. And so dealing with that aspect of it has been a challenge to say the least. Um, and, and certainly, I think that one of the things that makes, in, in, in getting to your question of, of what we can do to make this more robust, I feel one of the best things we can do is more collaboration. And this gets back to some of the earlier answers, too, on working together. But I see our program as a collaborative snow survey program, and not just in the manual measurements, but there's other ways that others can invest in-kind services, time, and efforts to increase and to um, improve on the data that we collect. And so really trying to establish better mechanisms for having collaboration on data collection certainly would be um, an, uh, a value to our program. And then the right. last thing I, I would mention real briefly here is just increasing the number of snow tell sites. There's not a scientist out there that would say they need less data or, doesn't, or don't want more sites of data collection. I think improving the network by increasing the number of snow tell sites, which would be a good investment of, of dollars, is is a, is a way for us to have better coverage and then more accurate forecasts based on that data that we collect and, and transmit. Okay, thank you all. Uh, we have one last question, which I think may be directed to me, given that the question is regarding the progress of water conservation exchanges and database reporting to state departments of water resources. Uh, and if anybody else wants to tackle that, you're welcome to. I, I can tell you that uh, working with the Western Governors Association, we have done quite a bit of work uh, on looking at water transfers and that many of the states uh, are encouraging conservation and then allowing some of that water to be exchanged. Uh, the reporting varies from state to state uh, as to water uses, uh, and that's one of the areas where our water data exchange uh, is directed to uh, provide more of that information regionally and make it more accessible. Uh, 
the uh, I, I have to say here from uh, from a Western water law perspective that many of us have heard that adage, uh, use it or lose it, and use that as a disincentive to conservation. Uh, but we forget that the state statutes and part of that uh, doctrine also prohibits waste uh, and uh, therefore requires that we be as efficient as possible. So maybe with that, that will cover a little bit of uh, that question, hopefully. And uh, let me turn the time back over to Carly to uh, wrap up. Thanks so much, Tony, and um, thank you so much for hosting. Thanks to all of our panelists for joining us. We have been so pleased with today's discussion. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of housekeeping announcements for those of you still on the phone. Um, first of all, we have two more webinars coming up in this webinar series. Um, next, um, in two weeks, we'll have Managing Forest Health for Water Resources at 11 a.m. Mountain Time on March 25th. Then again at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, this time on April 8th, we're going to have a webinar on um, why variation in hydrology and legal structures means that drought looks different across the West. So it's sort of getting more at that point that Deke raised about uh, drought impacts. Uh, drought, drought, drought looks different um, depending on where you sit. Um, so I just want to also let you guys know that there will be a wrap-up email coming on Friday with a link to the webinar recording that we'll post on YouTube and also a link to a downloadable copy of the presentation and a summary of key discussion points that were brought up today. We'll also ask you to please um, check out our website at westgov.org. There you'll be able to find our Drought Forum online resource library, which features case studies and best practices on drought management and uh, also meeting summaries and, and different informational tools that we've gathered along the way. If there's anything on that website missing, we really urge you to email us. My email personally is cbrown at westgov.org, and we'd love to get your feedback on what else we need to make sure is on that on that uh, online resource. So again, thank you all for joining and we hope that we'll see you again next time.